It's all the news you can use. The week's most impactful stories and newsmakers from around our metro. It's your Kansas City Week Reviewed, next. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlies Gorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. I'm Nick Haynes, and thank you so much for being with us as we connect the dots on the local news of our week around the cozy confines of our Week in Review table. Mr. Up to Date on KCUR FM, Steve Kraske. From KNBC 9 News, Chief Political Reporter Michael Mahoney. From the Tribune News Service, nationally syndicated columnist Mary Sanchez. And from the pages of your Kansas City star, Dave Helling. Mayor Quinton Lucas this week unveils his plans for pardoning thousands of Kansas Citians convicted in municipal court on marijuana charges. For some time now, uh, decades, the mayor of Kansas City has had a pardon power. Uh, and two rare of occasions do we actually uh, use it. This is a change today. Is the city combing through their records and stamping pardon on every court file with a marijuana connection? Or do you have to ask to be pardoned, Michael Mahoney? No, they're not combing through it. And you do have to ask, as of Thursday afternoon, about a dozen people had already requested uh, this. You have to go on the website for the city. You have to fill out a form. You also have to go to the municipal court uh, and get a copy of your conviction and your criminal records and submit that. This uh, is intended for low-level, uh, small-time marijuana offenders that have been popped on city charges. State charges are something completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big uh, onus here on the person that wants to request a pardon to gather all the facts. How easy is this process, though, Dave Howling? Can you even e is it easy to find on the website? And is there a thousand questions you have to answer? You don't have to answer a thousand questions. Uh, I went to the website. Fairly easy to get to. Um, but the question, of course, Nick, is whether the effort is worth the reward on the other side. Some of these convictions, again, only in municipal court, which, by the way, extends to uh, marijuana paraphernalia as well as marijuana itself. Yeah. Some of them go back 10, 12 years, uh, may have been forgotten by a lot of the people who might otherwise qualify. And the idea that you would now apply for a pardon, your name perhaps becoming public one way or another, uh, the disincentives to go through this process are relatively high, so we'll see what happens. Now, the mayor has said if you are going to go through this process and you are pardoned, you, you no longer have to pick the yes box. When you're asked on a job application, for instance, um, have you had a criminal record? Is that enough of a value for people to go through this process, Mary? I think some might assume that it is, um, but so many people, I think this is in their past, and they would rather not bring it up again. And especially as Dave just said, it kind of opens the door that this will be a formal record that you even made this application. So I'll be real curious just to see how it plays out in the community as more people talk about it, learn about it, go through the process. I've seen this uh, stated also in some of the news reports, Steve, that this is a pardon, not an exoneration. Right. What, what is the difference there? Well, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm seeing much of a difference here because there's some fuzziness even on the mm -hmm. notion as to whether folks who are pardoned would still have to uh, note this on job applications or not. That question remains a little unclear. So to the points being made here, you begin to wonder what exactly is the value here? Michael. Uh, this does not expunge a record. Okay? No. And, uh, and the mayor was quite clear about that, but he does believe that it, as he says, it's an issue of, uh, uh, of fairness. All the questions that we've raised here today are, are very valid, and I think it's an acknowledgement uh, that we're in, uh, we're in 2020 and not 2010 and certainly not 1970 or something like that, that uh, the public's approach towards marijuana is very different. Now. But not the police chief, though. He has said right. openly that there are some crimes, even big crimes in this community, that are happening where marijuana is the gateway drug. Right, and I think the broader point in all of this, Nick, is and we've talked about it on this show. The rules, regulations, laws surrounding marijuana are about as confusing as you can possibly get between the federal government, the state government, medical marijuana, low-level possession cases in municipal court, the jurisdictions between Clay County and Jackson County. Uh, you know, there does seem to be a sense that everyone needs to get on the same page and decide whether this is a substance that is acceptable in contemporary 
uh, United States or still something that we need to get after? And we have not reached that consensus. Well, yet. I think we have reached the consensus. Well, you and that. I may have, and other people yeah. may have, but the leadership of the community, you can do something in Jackson County that will get you years in prison if you did it in Clay County. So, uh, I, you know, I do or think... Or if you it, slip over from Kansas City, correct, Missouri into Johnson County correct, on the Kansas side. Correct. Yeah. Completely right. correct. Four right. months ago, he was topping the headlines in Kansas City. Carlos Maguire, one of the most prominent judges on the federal bench on the Kansas side of our state line, is issued a rep public reprimand for sexual misconduct, from harassing employees to sending suggestive texts to female court workers to having an affair with a convicted felon on probation. Now this week, he has resigned. Four months ago, we were told federal judges are appointed for life, making top judges like Magia immune from public displeasure. So why is he departing the bench now? Well, I think the pressure was simply growing, and the judge himself acknowledged that in his statement when he uh, resigned that he no longer can serve effectively, Nick. The U.S. Committee on Judicial Conduct and Disability was taking a hard look at him. Dave and the editorial board at the Star had called for his resignation. Uh, other judges had stripped away uh, lawsuits on Merguia's docket yeah. involving other employment discrimination type cases. It just was simply becoming an untenable situation. I, and oftentimes in these cases you will hear somebody who is actually going to, and they're going to say they're retiring, they're going to spend more time with their family, but he's not going to actually get any benefits. He's not even going to no. get any retirement money for his time on the bench. No, he doesn't get the pension, and that was even stipulated in the resignation, as it should be. I mean, you know, these, you're not crowned king, and the people who knew that court well said that he had functioned for a long time by hiring very good clerks, um, very good staffing, and it was, you know, it was an open secret of what was occurring, and he knew that. So it was time to step aside. So even though stepping aside, does this still have a lingering uh, effect on people's, uh, uh, certainly a perception of the judiciary in this community? Well, that was the concern, yeah. of yeah. course, and there were whispers, actually, mm -hmm. Nick, of, of potential impeachment by the House of Representatives mm -hmm. based yeah. on this behavior, and a trial in the Senate, which would have been extraordinarily difficult. That may have led, in part, to Carlos Murguia's decision. But it is such a rare thing for judges to discipline other judges in the federal system, that resignation was probably inevitable months ago uh, when the first report came out. You know, this is just a, a rare black mark on perhaps the most prominent family in Kansas City, Kansas, the Merguia family, two federal judges in that family, the woman, uh, Janet, who heads the National Latino Organization in this country, extremely proud, extremely prominent family, and uh, who have done so much for the community. Uh, this is a very rare uh, back step for them. Last week, a very public resignation in the Shawnee Mission School District as a middle school teacher is captured on tape reprimanding her former bosses and telling them she'd had enough. Just like a bad relationship, our communication has broken down. You aren't listening. There will be no clarifying questions. I don't answer to you anymore. Well, this week, the Kansas Department of Labor now siding with Shawnee Mission teachers. In a new ruling, the Labor Department says the district's new contract was not a good faith negotiation and was done to interfere with teacher rights. Has the damage already been done, or does this new decision stop an exodus of teachers leaving the Shawnee Mission School District, Michael? I don't think it does stop it, uh, the exodus. Uh, when, when I worked this story uh, on it, a lot of teachers said, a lot of teachers had an option at 4.30 last Friday to either sign the deal or quit. Most of them signed the deal, uh, virtually all of them, uh, for that matter. Only, but, only two people, I think, yeah, did exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. And, and because the teachers are saying, man, we're not leaving our kids in the middle of the school year. At the end of the school year may be a very different situation. Okay, so even though they're not re resigning now, it could turn that way later. So this is not the end of the story, Steve? No, not at all. I think Mike's point is, is spot on. The numbers, 1,939 of 2,000 employees actually signed a three-year deal. So only about 60 did not. And only two so far have resigned. But to Michael's point, yeah, look out for the end of the school year. Well, and here's the thing. It's like the issues that are on the table have not been resolved. And especially coming in with the state labor board, saying that, well, you cannot just shove a three-year contract down there, you know, down these teachers. Um, you know, they're not going to take that. The other thing is Shawnee Mission, you know, is changing dramatically, like a lot of school districts. They need more diverse quality staff. They need their senior master's levels teachers. They want to retain that staff as people are also retiring out as baby boomers. Um, you know, it's a huge mix that's going on. So what Shawnee Mission needs to do is address these real concerns. 
Yeah, the other thing, that uh, Mary, that I was struck when you read that Department of Labor letter, especially from the Department of Labor of the state of Kansas, this is a slam dunk on behalf of the teachers. I mean, it's just uh, without much defense at all or explanation on behalf of the school board. Nick, as you mentioned, the, they determined that the school board imposed this contract rather than agree to a deal uh, with their teachers because they want to move on to other, uh, other things. It was a big, big slap at the district and the school board. So we saw that teacher resignation. Let's talk about some other big public resignations. The former governor of Missouri, remember him? He's on a comeback tour on a media swing through the state this week. Eric Greitens is declaring himself an innocent man after a new exhaustive state ethics report clears him, he says, of any wrongdoing. It is good to have been exonerated. I am really glad that we were, we were vindicated. And I'm, I'm grateful that the truth is, is finally coming out. Now you got lawyer politicians who are making false accusations. Um, and I think what's nice now is that everybody knows and everybody can see. That's exactly what this was. Greitens in Kansas City also speaking with frequent Week in Review guest Pete Mundo on KCMO Talk Radio. Did we learn, though, anything new from the former governor about his plans for the future? Yeah, I thought we did. I listened to Pete's interview on that. And one of the things that, that uh, Greitens said was that, because Pete asked him, what's your next plans? Is there a political comeback com uh, coming? And what he said is, Tomorrow, next week, next month, this year, I'm going to focus on uh, telling people that I have been exonerated. And so that's going to be, his, I believe the phrase was 100% foc uh, focused on that. That'll be the exoneration tour uh, for Eric Greitens over the course of the next year. And then perhaps in the following election cycle, we might see Eric Greitens back. I saw, Mary, you had a national column this week about Michael Bloomberg, and, and should he be forgiven by the black and brown community in this country because of his stop and frisk policies in New York City? How about Eric Greitens? Is forgiveness in the offering for him? Well, I believe in redemption, but here's the thing, and this is also what I said about Bloomberg, is that you have a lot of explaining to do. You know, there's a lot of making up. Bloomberg, in his case, he was completely just off the rails, did not really understand some things that he said. And Greitens, by trying to claim that he was exonerated, is basically telling a lie. And people need to remember that. And it's just a situation you can go around and try and claim that something didn't happen. What you really need to do is explain yourself more because we know it did happen. I, I dismissed the story last week because I thought, uh, well, you know, he's not really going to make a comeback. But listening to him, he looks like somebody who's ready for the next move. He does. And if he's angry enough, and he very well may be, Nick, just think what the potential could be here. What if he chooses not to run as a Republican in the primary against the sitting incumbent, Mike Parson? What if he decides to run as an independent in November and just attempt to siphon enough of votes w away yeah. from Parson that it opens up the door to a Democrat like, like the Cole Galloway? We'll have to wait and see what Dave. happens. Yeah. Remember that the opposition to Eric Greitens at the end came primarily from Republicans, not Democrats, fellow Republicans who still mm -hmm. dislike him intensely. He had very few friends. That doesn't seem to have changed. But every Republican I talked to over the past couple of days is trying to figure out what he wants to do. Yes. The idea that he might run in 2020 scares them. But the reality is if he runs and loses, uh, his career would be effectively over. At that point, the verdict of the, uh, the people would be clear. So I think that the speculation that he may be waiting for something four years down the road is probably Michael, closer to accurate. Very quickly. To, to, uh, uh, accent Mary's point here that that he told a lie about exoneration. He was fined by the Missouri Ethics Commission one hundred and seventy eight thousand dollars, which for the MEC is an enormous <laughs> fine. It's millions. And, and, uh, <laughs> and he gets a sweetheart deal that if he pays thirty eight K in the next uh, six weeks, then then he's off the hook. But that was an enormous fine. He was fined. And that was not an exoner exoneration. Just over a year ago, one of the biggest news stories in Kansas City was about the police chief in KCK living in a county-owned home rent-free in exchange for fixing the place up. It had sparked a KBI investigation, and he would retire within months. Were there lessons learned from that blow-up, and were they remembered in Clay County, where this week a similar story is playing out? This time, it's two top county administrators who both earn more than $100,000 a year who are living rent-free at a county apartment at a lake house. In the case of the KCK police chief, his defense was that the house was in poor shape and the county was better off having him live there, making repairs to the property in exchange for the rent. What's the explanation offered in Clay County for the two officials getting their homes rent-free, Dave? Uh, that the officials involved in this case are somehow on call 
and therefore deserve somehow to uh, live rent free. The specifics are not completely clear. The chain of command is not completely clear. It was a great story. I think KCUR broke the story and it was uh, a very clearly uh, called for some sort of backing up by the elected officials. North Just Oklahoma. looking at that video though, these are not luxury mansions that they're living in, Mary. No, they're not. Um, however, I think most people do struggle sometimes to pay their rent and their mortgage. Mm -hmm. And so it just reeks of some sort of malfeasance. I think, you know, some of the, the reporting was wonderful by KCUR and really in depth. And I think, you know, the, the homes for the rangers around Smithville Lake, that makes sense. That makes some sense. But to have someone who's going to claim at an administrative level that they need to be on call 24-7, most of us are on call 24-7 by our cell phones. They can work it that way. There's a drip, drip, drip of negative stories about Clay County all the <laughs> yeah. time. But if we had a Clay County top official here right now, how would they be defending themselves on this story, Michael? It depends on which official you'd be talking about at that yeah, time. Exactly. KCUR did a nice piece on this story. Matt Fleener has also been on this for, uh, for, for Channel 9. I owe that to, to say that to, uh, to Matt. Jerry Nolte, who is the presiding uh, commissioner uh, up there, uh, once again believes that he is out of the loop on this thing um, and getting the other officials of Clay County to talk about this is difficult. And uh, as you mentioned, Nick, and you're right on the spot on, on this, the optics of what's going on in Clay County government continues to be a really sad story. And this is just an, uh, another one. It'll be real interesting to see what Clay County voters do at the ballot box this year. But, but it, 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 do you just have to wait till the next election? What else can you do as a member of the public to express your displeasure. Well, you would think, Nick, that in a normal world that members of the public could go to the Clay County Commission meetings and express their displeasure, but only in Clay County, Missouri, ha have the commissioners eliminated the public comment period. There hasn't been one for a couple of years. You can show up on a Friday afternoon and talk to an aide about your displeasure. But to Michael's point, Clay County continues to be an astonishing mess. Next up, they got the biggest incentive deal ever awarded in the state of Missouri, $1.6 billion. Now, Cerner is trying to renegotiate the terms of the tax breaks it was awarded for building its new mega campus on the site of the former Bannister Mall. Aside from bringing up to 16,000 jobs to the area, Cerner pledged to create a retail development near the corner of I-435 and Bannister Road. Now company leaders say they don't want to do that anymore and want to sell off the land to a private developer. Is Kansas City's largest private employer reneging on its promises, or does the phrase pledge to do something mean something totally different than the phrase required to do something, Dave? <laughs> well, uh, there may be a difference without a distinction or whatever the saying might be. It was clear at the time and remains clear that the people in the neighborhood believed that in exchange for these incentives from the city of Kansas City, Cerner would not only reclaim the old Bannister Mall property, which was blighted, but provide amenities for the surrounding neighborhood, do more for the local school district, the Hickman Mill School District, and generally help revitalize that difficult area of Kansas City. Cerner now says we don't have the expertise to do uh, developments other than a Taco Bell apparently and maybe a, an economy hotel. Uh, th there is great, and I must say, we, we've conducted some mayoral debates uh, down south, uh, Ruskin High, there is great frustration with City Hall on projects like this because the people in the area believe they were promised something. They think Cerner is reneging, even though the letter of the law might suggest that there are ways to adjust. Let's take a trip down memory lane if we can. What was the expectation when the deal was first signed? Here's then Mayor Sly James at the groundbreaking for Cerner's new campus in 2014. It's not only going to be these buildings, but it will spur other development of retail around the development itself. That's absolutely crucial to the people who live in this part of town. It's absolutely crucial to the growth of Kansas City and to the tax base of Kansas City. So isn't that what residents in that area were counting on, Mary? Absolutely, and here's where you lose the faith of the public. And I'll fess up, I am from that area. I actually used to run cross country through um, what became so did Bannister Helling, Mall. Actually. Yeah, yeah, well, as they um, that is really did. <laughs> I've literally run every road okay. in South Kansas City many, many times. But, um, you know, the people out there, they remember when, like, the, the vibrancy of, like, Marion Labs and when Bannister Mall first yeah. came up. And, it, you know, it was an astounding decline over a 30-year time period. And here was this same chunk of property which was so well known as Benjamin Stables, you know, was a branch in horsing. Um, 
it was a huge part of the community and it has just struggled and struggled and then they believed in their public officials, they believed in Cerner that this might bring a new day, a new area and really help the community. So what, what, is the, what are the lessons then to be learned for city officials today about making promises, a company saying they're going to bring all of these jobs and do all of these things? You know, trust but verify, okay. the, uh, the old line here. This is a $1.6 billion TIF. It's one of the biggest in America. It's now going to be the poster child for, uh, for TIF ab abuse. And I think that the TIF Commission is, uh, has some responsibility here about making sure what they're told is going to be uh, carried out. Just quickly, this agreement is broken up into 16 different chunks, Nick, and it allows the city to uh, claw back some of this money if some of these uh, different phases don't go through. So there is some hope for the city, at least in, in that sense of the word. Final point, we should all keep an eye on Cerner and Absolutely. the forward trajectory of that company. New leadership, new focus on big data, things are changing there. It'll be interesting to see how financially <coughs> successful they are going forward. If that's a factor in all of this and their decision to pull back, we'll have to keep an eye okay, on that. There's never an election year these days in our area when you're not asked to amend your state constitution on one issue or another. In Kansas right now, there's a push to have you vote on amending the constitution on the issue of abortion. In Missouri, there's a push to have you amend the state constitution to allow for Medicaid expansion. But is that about to become a lot more difficult to achieve this week, Missouri lawmakers deliberating over a plan to require a two-thirds vote of the public to enact an amendment? Right now it takes a simple majority. Why do some lawmakers want to change the current system, Dave? Well, because they don't like the public doing what they don't want done. Medicaid expansion is a good example, but clean Missouri is really yep. the thing that frustrated them most of all. But they're yeah, trying to uh, repeal that, and so by putting it at two-thirds, wouldn't it hurt their chances no, of actually getting that No, but see, this is how done? it would work. You put the repeal on in August, okay. and you put the two-thirds requirement on in August, so you could repeal Clean Missouri with a simple majority, then enact the two-thirds for Medicaid expansion the following November. That, at least, is one of the plans involved. The legislature is convinced that it's brilliant, and the rest of the people in Missouri are stupid, and therefore you need to have a super majority to But uh, other states do that. I've noticed that even like Florida, and I think Illinois, Illinois has that, and in Nevada, you have to actually vote in two successive elections to actually pass an amendment. In fact, 11 states require okay. that. So the idea of making it more difficult isn't unusual, but you make it two-thirds, Nick, nothing's going to pass. By the way, it's yeah. that time of the year in both sessions of the legislature where all manner of bills comes to light that you had absolutely no clue about. We feel an obligation to keep you informed. A bill before Kansas lawmakers would prohibit <laughs> discrimination against businesses that manufacture or sell firearms. If passed, it would block anyone from refusing to to do business with companies solely because they're involved in the weapons trade. Are gun, law, are gun makers being discriminated against in Kansas, Michael? Uh, there is one gun manufacturer in the state, the state of Can Kansas, and that's one of the elements that are driving this bill. Other than, the other one, of course, is the, uh, the support for the Second Amendment and gun, right, uh, gun rights in this. Uh, we'll see where this goes. It's interesting to note <clears throat> that in Kansas City, Missouri, there was a court settlement against a gun manufacturer in, in sale taking, uh, using uh, a law from about 15 year years ago that had been rarely used. The Lucas administration uh, went after it. We'll see. Also, you've heard of parents behaving badly. Now, lawmakers in both Kansas and Missouri considering bills to protect referees and umpires at your kids' sporting events. Kansas pushing to increase fines and impose up to six months in jail for attacking an official. Missouri considering making referees and umpires a special class of victim. So to strike a sports official would be punished with the same severity as assaulting a police officer or firefighter. What's the push behind that? The growing problem of uh, attacks, abuses, and uh, threats on, on officials. I used to be a, a basketball record yeah. a long time ago. It was not like that uh, when I was officiating, but it is a problem now. Uh, there, it's such a problem that people don't want to be refs anymore. And so the average age of an official in the state of Missouri is over 50. There are guys and uh, people in their 70s that are, uh, that are still doing this. And the problem is expensive. Especially, especially worse at the local youth league level where uh, this uh, tradition of uh, challenging everything goes on. There's less supervision. It's a problem on both sides of the state line. Well, and it's also very expensive even for the schools as they have to hire the off-duty police officers to come in and be there on the spot. I don't know that you really need like a special 
area for the you know referees to protect them, but they do need to just start to crack down. An assault is an assault and see these things through the courts. When you put a program like this together every week, you can't get to every major local news story. What was the big story we missed? Was it the school crossing guard in KCK who sacrifices his life to save two children? If he would have survived this thing, he would have wanted all this attention on him because that's, that's how you're supposed to do things. Kansas City's top health official with advice for everyone in the Metro. Everybody can take a deep breath and relax. There are no cases of COVID-19 here in Kansas City. But keep washing your hands for Kansas Cityans, he says, have already died from the flu. I thought people didn't drink milk anymore, so why are people waiting in lines for as long as seven hours for this milk? It's been 50 years since they won the Super Bowl, and it's impossible not to want to be part of that. And another big retail name fast disappearing from Kansas City, Pier One shuttering five area stores from Olathe to Lee Summit as the company files for bankruptcy. All right, Steve Kraske, did you pick one of those stories or something completely different? Well, I thought the, the story about Bob Nill, the crossing guard, dying in Kansas City, Kansas, absolutely heartbreaking. That's what caught my attention this week. Michael. Uh, the story I did about uh, Susan Wagel trying to go, uh, uh, leave Kansas government and appeal to the Trump administration to get an ambassadorial ship uh, because she thought it was a good time to leave Kansas politics in advance of the governor's race. Mary. You know, I would still like to see more reporting on the fallout locally with the Boy Scouts um, filing for their bankruptcy. There are, including my two older brothers, there are a lot of Eagle Scouts in this area. The um, H.R. Bartle, you know, scout camp down in Osceola, Missouri is huge for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, Good, good point. The head of the police board, Nathan Garrett, said the city <clears throat> needs 65 more police officers. That isn't yeah. going to happen. It's far too expensive. But the city council is proceeding with a plan to study local control of the police department, and that will be an issue throughout 2020. Okay, I'll pick up some of those stories next week. That is our Week in Review. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.